Thank you guys so much for joining us. If you've got that mobile app, I want to invite you to just go ahead and open it up right now. Before we get into Nehemiah chapter 5, I want us to just pause for a second, and I want us to recognize mothers, because of course today is Mother's Day. And moms, you do an awful lot for us day in and day out. But over the last couple of months, you've probably been working nonstop every second trying to take care of the house and trying to take care of the children and also trying to be their teacher and trying to get some work done at the same time. Moms, if you were here in person today, we would want to give you a carnation. But because you're not here in person, we can't give you that carnation and so what we want to offer you for just a second today, instead of a carnation, is a quarantine. I got this funny Mother's Day video that I'd like for you to see. Y'all check out this video about how mom needs a break right now. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy, where are you going? sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you'd speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Uh... Mom, you're breaking everything. Know how that feels right now, ladies? Hey, we just want to say thank you. We just want to say that we love you. Moms, thanks for all that you do for us. Big mamas out there who are taking care of your grandchildren, thank you for how hard you work. And we also want to remember those women who really wish that they could be mamas, but they're not. Because Mother's Day hurts for those ladies, those folks that lost their mother this year. Mother's Day hurts. So we just want to take a moment as a church and recognize moms. Thank you, moms. We want to recognize those people that are hurting today because of Mother's Day. All right, let's jump into Nehemiah chapter 5. If you're joining us online in our live stream for the first time, let me just give you a very quick summary of how we get to Nehemiah chapter 5 today. Nehemiah is a Jew. He's living in Persia. He works for the king. This is the equivalent of working in the White House, meaning this guy's got it made. And he hears about problems that are going on back in his ancestors' land, back in the city of Jerusalem. And God starts to get a hold of Nehemiah's heart. Nehemiah's heart. And you know how it is, y'all. When God gets a hold of your heart, he doesn't let it go. And Nehemiah can't get this out of his head. So me, Nehemiah decides, I've got to do something about this. He asks his boss, the king, can I leave? Can I go to Jerusalem? Can I help my people? Can I try to rebuild the city? When Nehemiah shows up, it's worse than the news reports. This is really bad. But Nehemiah rolls up his sleeves and he gets to work and he starts to rebuild the walls. And he's doing some really good things 
And then, of course, all of the critics start to complain. But Nehemiah doesn't let that get him off track. He stays on task. He stays focused in spite of the criticism, in the middle of the death threats. And when we get to Nehemiah chapter 5, he already has to deal with some pretty big problems. But today, he has to deal with an even bigger problem. You see, this problem isn't outside the walls of Jerusalem. This is a problem inside of the walls. This is a problem inside the heart of the people of Jerusalem. You see, what we're going to look at today for just a few moments from Nehemiah chapter 5 is what happens when greed gets into people's hearts. What happens to the people of God when greed gets into their hearts. And I just want to tell you where we're going to go with this sermon today. Here's what I want you to see. I hope that the Holy Spirit will burn this into your heart and you'll never forget it. Greed robs everyone of greatness. Greed's going to rob you of greatness. Greed will rob those people around you of greatness. Some of the worst atrocities in human history have happened as a result of greed. Oh, the history books try to cover it up by using slick phrases like um, manifest destiny or like states' rights or like um, the room to expand. But really what we're describing is when greed gets into a person's heart, it leads to stuff like human trafficking or slavery or the Holocaust. This is how serious greed is. And today, Nehemiah has to deal with greed. It's not a problem outside the walls. This is a problem inside the heart of the Jews. And what we're going to see for just a second is how Nehemiah tackles head-on the problem of greed in Jerusalem. He does it in three very, uh, severe, very severe, very in uh, important ways. Step one is Nehemiah has to first recognize, you know what the problem here is? The problem is greed. And the first step is always to recognize it. You see, greed is a thief. Greed will take something from you. It will promise to give you something, but in reality, it's going to take from you and never give you all that it promises. Greed is when you're craving for more, and as you try to get more, Greed steals contentment from you. Greed is when you're passionate for possessions and you really want more money. And what greed will do is take that passion for possessions and it will steal peace from you. Greed will always take more from you than it gives. And today, Nehemiah has to confront greed. He has to confront it head on. He has to confront it very severely. So we're going to start reading in Nehemiah chapter 5 in verse 1. If you've got that mobile app open, look at what the Bible says. Nehemiah chapter 5 will start in verse 1 and we'll see how Nehemiah recognizes the problem of greed in Jerusalem many years ago. The Bible says there was a widespread, widespread outcry from the people and their wives against their Jewish countrymen. Now, Nehemiah has already had to deal with some criticism back in the earlier chapters. He's already had some people complaining. And basically, there are two types of complainers. You have this serial complainer. You have this compulsive critic that's always complaining, always saying that they've got it wrong. Come on, y'all. You know what people like this are like. They're the ones that when you start to talk about a difficulty, they've got it much worse than you. When you start to talk about stress or troubles that you're dealing with, they've always got it work. They're worse. They're the kind of, I have to walk two miles uphill both ways in the snow just to get to work people. And you're thinking to yourself, this is South Georgia. We don't get snow and it's physically impossible to go uphill both ways. That just doesn't work. These are the kind of serial complainers and nobody likes them. Their mother doesn't even like them. Moms, you have to love them, but you don't have to like the serial complainer. Nobody likes, nobody listens to the serial complainer because all they do is complain. 
That's the first type of complainer. The second kind of complainer is what we're reading about in Nehemiah chapter 5. This is the good, the godly, the very gracious guy or gal who rarely ever says that there's anything going wrong. But when they do say that there's something going wrong, when they do complain, people are going to stand up and take notice because they rarely ever point out how bad it is. So when they point something out, it must be really bad. And in Nehemiah chapter 5, these gracious, godly people are going to point out to Nehemiah something really, really bad is happening. And here's what they were saying. Some were saying, we, our sons and our daughters are numerous. Let us get grain so that we can eat and live. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, vineyards, and houses to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have borrowed money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. We're like we and our children are just like our countrymen and their children, yet we are subjecting our sons and daughters, get this, to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. These godly, gracious people are now coming to Nehemiah and saying, hey, we've got a problem, a really big problem. You see, there was a famine in the land. This is kind of the equivalent of the Great Depression, and it took everything from everybody. Everybody was universally impacted by the famine, kind of like the economic impact as a result of COVID is doing to people all over our country and around the world right now. And on top of the famine, look on the screens. Then you have this exorbitant tax that the king is charging. Can't do anything about the famine. That's out of our control. Can't do anything about the tax, though I absolutely hate the idea that the government can do better with my money than I can do with my money. I got to pay the tax. That's not what we're complaining about, Nehemiah. What we need to talk to you about is what's happening to us as a result of our own countrymen. And this is nothing short of greed. People are loaning money and they're charging extremely high interest. And this isn't a physical problem that Nehemiah has to deal with today. This is a spiritual problem. Something has got into the heart of God's people and is causing God's people to take advantage of one another, to hurt the weak and the vulnerable and the helpless. And they tell Nehemiah, look, Nehemiah, we are powerless to do anything about this. We're powerless to even work on the walls. Do you know that that word powerless is Nehemiah's way of doing a kind of a play on words? Because back in chapter 4, Nehemiah described how hard you have to work with one hand to grow something. And you've got a shovel in one hand. And how hard you have to work to guard something. You've got a sword in the other hand. Go back and watch last week's sermon. But the word that Nehemiah uses for powerless literally means our hands are weak. Nehemiah, we can't guard. Nehemiah, we can't grow. Nehemiah, we can't do anything. Our hands are weak. Because we're being taken advantage of. We're being taken advantage of by greedy Christians, by greedy people. And they're not outside the walls of Jerusalem. These are God's people taking advantage of us. Greed can get inside the heart. And when it comes to money, people will do terrible things to one another. When you've done as much marriage counseling as I have, you will see just how bad it gets between two people that should love each other when greed starts to become the problem in a relationship. And that's what we're re reading about in Nehemiah chapter 5. Now, up to this point, Nehemiah spent his time trying to work on the walls and trying to rebuild the city. And now Nehemiah has something that he has to deal with immediately you see, this is an internal problem. And don't make a mistake, y'all. 
Internal problems are always some of the most severe. Internal problems will always have the biggest impact on external progress. When there's a problem in your company, you have to deal with that problem very swiftly and very severely. When there's a problem in a church, you have to deal with that problem very quickly because internal problems will always have the biggest impact on external progress. That's why Two Cities Church takes harmony so seriously. Notice what I, sa I said. I use the word harmony, not the word uniformity. We don't expect everyone in this church to look alike or to act alike or even to follow the same steps as one another. But we do expect people to love one another and to get along with one another. This is part of being the family of God, part of being brothers and sisters in Christ. Internal problems always have the biggest external progress, that will always hurt external progress. And Nehemiah first has to recognize grief. Now that he's figured out what the problem is, okay, we're dealing with greed. The next step is for people to repent of greed. And the idea of repenting is saying it's more than just going to God and saying, I'm sorry. It's doing something about it. You see, God didn't promise to meet your greed. He promised that he would always meet your need, which means you can want things. I need you to understand this for me. I need you to hear this for me for just a second. There's nothing wrong. It's not a sin to want, but there is a fine line. It's very subtle, but it's very dangerous in the Bible where you go from wanting something that somebody else has, you notice that they have a set of golf clubs, you see the kind of guns that they have, you notice the kind of cars that they drive, and there's nothing wrong with noticing that. There's nothing wrong with wanting it, but if you're not careful, you will cross an invisible barrier, and now it's not wanting it. Now it's become coveting it. Now it's become greedy for it. And this is a sin in the Bible. A sin that is severe and must be dealt with. So let's see how Nehemiah deals with this scene. Nehemiah chapter 5, we'll pick up at verse 6. When Nehemiah learned that this was God's people taking advantage of God's people, it's Christians taking advantage of other Christians. Here's what he says. I became extremely angry when I heard their outcries and these complaints. Pause for just a second. Nehemiah is witnessing the Old Testament equivalent of the title pawn business, and it's got him furious. And you should be furious. I should be furious when people take advantage of somebody who's in a rough spot, when they take advantage of somebody who's weak or vulnerable. It should infuriate you like it infuriated Nehemiah. By the way, this isn't just a bad business. This is a sin. Nehemiah knows this. The people of God know this. Exodus 22, Deuteronomy 23 are very clear that God's people are not supposed to charge interest to other people. And that's what's going on. This title pawn business that's going on in Nehemiah's day has got him furious. It's got him furious, listen to me, like Jesus got furious about this. Because there's this story in the New Testament where Jesus walks into the temple in Jerusalem and he sees something that is so wrong that he starts flipping over tables and whipping people across their back to stop what they're doing. What could be so serious that the Son of God would resort to physical violence to put an end to it? Jesus is witnessing in the New Testament what Nehemiah is dealing with in the Old Testament. People are taking advantage of each other. They're taking advantage of the poor. They're taking advantage of the helpless. They're taking advantage 
of the vulnerable. And it's got Nehemiah furious. It's got Jesus furious. It should make you furious like it makes me furious. But this guy's a genius because he's angry. And he doesn't just send that flame an email. He doesn't just bombard that person with text. He doesn't just blow up their phone with this volcanic voicemail. He pauses, counts to 10, thinks about how he's going to react, and then he deals decisively with the sin of greed. I became extremely angry when I heard their outcries and these complaints. And after considering the matter, I accused the nobles and officials to saying to them, each of you is charging his countrymen interest. So I called a large assembly against them and said, we have done our best to buy back our Jewish countrymen who were sold to foreigners, but now you sell your own countrymen and we have to buy them back. And they remained silent and could not say a word. And then I said, what you're doing isn't right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God and not invite the reproach of foreign armies? Nehemiah is going to tackle the big boys in town. He's going to take on the heavy hitters. And instead of going to them one-on-one, -on -one, he calls the entire people of Jerusalem to come together. This is the equivalent of the entire church in Jerusalem. This is Old Testament example of church discipline. This is why Two Cities Church practices church discipline. When there's a problem and it's severe, it has to be dealt with in a loving, gracious, but in a firm way. And that's what Nehemiah is doing. So he calls an assembly. All of the people stop working on the walls and come and listen to what's going to happen next. And he says, y'all, what's happening is wrong. And we're charging interest. This is strictly forbidden in the Bible, but we're charging interest. And we're not charging interest to the foreigners. We're doing this to our own friends and neighbors. This is God's people taking advantage of God's people. This is so serious that Nehemiah has to deal with it, and he has to deal with it immediately because this isn't a problem that's outside the walls. This is a problem that's inside the walls of Jerusalem. This is a problem that's inside the heart of God's people. So Nehemiah calls them on the carpet and they don't have a word that they can say about it. And as I was reading through Nehemiah chapter five this week, as I started to work through this passage of scripture, and I've read this dozens, scores of times, I got to verse 10 and it stopped me in my tracks because I started to notice something that I had never seen before in the book of Nehemiah. I was so confused that this week I consulted 27 different commentaries. That's not an exaggeration to see what does verse 10 describe. Those commentaries are basically split down the middle about what we're reading here. So then I had to go back and do some original word study and look at the original words in the Hebrew language to see what we read next. Nehemiah has this assembly. He calls everybody to say, charging interest and taking advantage of the weak, it's wrong and we should repent. Not just say it's wrong, but do something about the wrong that we've done. And then verse 10, even I, as well as my brothers and my servants have been lending them money and grain. Then this, please let us stop charging this interest. Let me explain to you what the Bible is saying here. Because Nehemiah is a businessman. He's got folks that work for him. He's got people that work for the people that work for him. And he's lending money. He's giving out grain. Nehemiah's business is going well. And when Nehemiah takes a step back and starts to look at the business practices, here's what 10, verse 10 and 11 are saying to us. Nehemiah notices, you know what? I'm doing the very same thing that these other nobles and officials are doing in Jerusalem. My business is taking advantage of people and I'm charging interest 
and I'm not supposed to. You see, the commentaries are basically split right down the middle on this. But when you get to this phrase, let us stop charging this interest, this is a first person verb. Nehemiah is saying, I'm doing this too. This is a big man who can stand before the entire assembly of God, having looked in the mirror and said, y'all, what we're doing is wrong and I'm guilty of it too. And I'm admitting to you that I'm guilty of it. And I need to stop. We all need to stop what's going on here. This is the equivalent of Look at taking the log out of your own eye before you point out the speck in your brother's eye. That's what Nehemiah is doing here. Here's what he says next. They, uh, he tells them, return their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses to them immediately. Along with the percentage of the money, grain, new wine, and fresh oil that you've been assessing them Nehemiah says, we've got to do something about this, and we've got to do something about this immediately. Nehemiah notices, we have been taking advantage of people, and even my company has been taking advantage of people that are weak, people that are powerless. This isn't a money problem. Please hear me today. Greed isn't a money problem. Greed is a morality problem. Greed is when something has moved into your heart and it has started to twist your heart and you would take advantage of the weak or the vulnerable to make more for yourself. I'm so proud of the folks from Two Cities Church last week that went to Chase Homes and tried to love our neighbor. Here's a picture of some of them. This isn't all of them. But last week, we showed up. You can see those bags of Burger King food. We showed up and knocked on people's doors and just did what the scriptures say that God's people are supposed to do. We're supposed to love God first and love our neighbor as ourselves. I think there's two reasons why it's really, really important, really beautiful to me that we went to Chase Homes. First reason, these are the weak these are the vulnerable in our community right now. If you don't know about Chase Homes located on 2nd Avenue, it's a housing project that's about to be torn down. The city is going to rebuild these houses farther on the north side of town, but the residents of Chase Homes were notified that they are going to be evicted in the next 30 days, and those new houses are not ready for them. So what they just learned is you have to get out and we don't have a place for you to go. And when Two Cities Church showed up and knocked on their door last week, people were in tears because of the stress and the vulnerability of not knowing where they're going to live next month. And that's when God prompted us to show up and to minister and to meet these needs right there. That's the first reason. But the second reason is because it's easy for us to start thinking about how bad we've got it until you go to a place like Chase Homes. Because when you go to a place like that, you start to see that there are some people that have it much worse than I do. And it starts to put what we do have into perspective. It starts to make us more thankful for what we do have instead of wanting and greedy for what we don't have. Just being in a place like Chase Homes allows Two Cities Church to do the work of rebuilding a broken city. But it also allows us to be a witness for our King Jesus Christ, so that when we knock on a door, we say, we're not asking for anything from you. We don't want anything from you. You don't even have to come to our church. We're just here to love you like the Bible says we're supposed to love, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And here's a free meal for you. And here's some free gifts for your children because we care about you. And I believe lives were touched. And I just want to say thank you for the folks that showed up and tried to minister at Chase Homes last week. Okay, so Nehemiah sees there's a problem in, in Jerusalem, and that problem is greed. First, he recognizes the need. And then secondly, he realizes, even I have been tempted. Even I have slipped into taking advantage and charging interest of the weak and the vulnerable. So the third and final step today 
is to recover from greed. You see, when greed gets inside your heart, it starts to take hold of your heart. And the only thing that will help you recover from greed, the only thing that will push greed out of your heart is wanting something more than what you want when you're being greedy. It's loving something more than possessions or money that will help you recover from greed. When you recognize that you've done wrong and you repent of the wrong that you've done, to say to God, God, what I've done is wrong. I'm not going to do it anymore. The third and the final step is to make it right. That's what helps you recover from the wrong that you've done. Look at what Nehemiah says in verses 12 and 13. The people are all standing around. They're all listening. Nehemiah has said, y'all, what we've done is wrong. And I just realized I'm doing it too. I'm wrong. And we need to make this right. And they responded, we will return these things and require nothing more from them, nothing more from our brothers and sisters. We will do as you say. So I summoned the priest and made everyone take an oath to do this. Basically, Nehemiah said, bring out the Bible. I want you to put your hand on the Bible and swear an oath to holy God in front of the entire assembly that God will strike you dead if you don't make this right. And here's what Nehemiah says next. I shook out the folds of my robe and I said, may God likewise shake from his house and property everyone who doesn't keep this promise. May he be shaken out and have nothing. And then the whole assembly said, amen. This word is, I agree. This word means, let it come to pass what you just said. The whole assembly said, amen. And they praised God. And then the people did as they had promised. I want you to picture this in your mind for just a second, because this is mind-blowing to me. Imagine that this is you, and you've been paying interest, and somebody's been taking advantage of you, and then all of a sudden, this week, the bank comes knocking on your door and says, you know what? We've charged you a lot of money in interest for your mortgage, and we were wrong, and here's a check for every penny of that interest that we've charged you. We're giving it all back to you. Imagine the IRS agent shows up and instead of auditing you, they say, you've given a lot of money in taxes and we're gonna give you every penny of that money back. Consider this, the credit card company calls and instead of telling you that you're late on a payment, they say, you bought some stuff and we've charged you outrageous interest on what you bought. So we're going to give you every penny of that interest back. What you're reading in Nehemiah chapter 5 is the equivalent of, in today's dollars, billions of dollars of transactions that are wiped off the books in one day because the people are so sorry for what they've done. And y'all, please hear me. When you've done wrong, you first take it to God and admit to God. This is repenting. Take it to God and admit to God, God, what I've done is wrong. But you don't stop there. You go and you try to make it right. When you've told a lie, you go straight to God and say, God, I know that what I've done is wrong. God, will you forgive me for the lie that I've told? And then you go from God straight to the person that you told the lie. And you go make it right by telling them the truth. When you took something that didn't belong to you, you admit to God, God, what I just did is wrong. It's a sin. Would you forgive me, God? But you don't stop there. You go to the person that you took something from and you go make it right. That's what we're reading about in the book of Nehemiah. That's how you recover from this terrible sin. It's so bad that it even gets into the heart of Nehemiah, this terrible sin of greed. You see, when greed starts to get into your heart, it will push God out. Jesus says it this way, you can't be great in God's eyes and greedy at the same time. You can't love God and love money at the same time. You will love one 
and hate the other, but you will not love them both. The New Testament in 1 Timothy chapter 6 says it this way, this is so terrible, greed is so destructive that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's basically saying there's no limit to how wicked people can become when it comes to greed. And unfortunately, it even impacts God's people. And sometimes greed gets into the church, into the people of God, and they will take advantage of other people. Nehemiah deals with this. He is very swift. He is very severe about the way that he deals with it. You see, greed is the opposite of godliness. I need you to hear this from me. The essence of greed is loving money and using people to get more. The essence of Christianity is loving people and using money. Let me say that again. The essence of greed is to love money and use people. The essence of following Jesus is to love people and use money to serve God and to bless God and to bless God's people. It's the opposite of, the, of greed. There's no way these two things can exist together. I'll wrap up with it this way. There was a preacher who lived many years ago, wrote a number of books, a guy by the name of G.K. Chesterton. And he was writing about just how serious greed is. And G.K. Chesterton described what happens when greed gets into the heart of people. He said it this way. He said, among the greedy, he actually used the word rich, but among the greedy, you will never find a really generous man. Even by accident, they're not generous. They may give their money away, but they will never give themselves away. They are egotistical, secretive, dry as old bones. Want to know how bad this is? Here's what G.K. Chesterton says about this. He said, to be smart enough to get that kind of money, greedy like this, to be smart enough to get that kind of money, you must be dull enough to want it. See, G.K. Chesterton is saying what Jesus said. He's saying what Nehemiah said, ultimately greed will start to push God out of your heart. And when you love Jesus, when you are trying to passionately follow Jesus, it must push greed out of your heart. There's no way these two things can exist at the same time. Nehemiah chapter 5 is a beautiful picture of a life that was changed, even Nehemiah's life that was changed when they realized the wrong that was going on, the wrong inside them. You see, here's the steps one more time. Nehemiah recognized greed. Maybe for you, it's a different sin, but he recognized it first, and you can't do anything. You can't attack the sin until you first recognize it. He recognized greed, and then Nehemiah repented of that greed. He went straight to God Asked God's people to go straight to God and admit that it's wrong, but he didn't stop there. Third and final step, in order to recover from that sin, in order to recover from greed, Nehemiah had to go make it right. He put before God's people the challenge, go fix it, and it's so important that you need to fix it today, immediately, before the sun goes down. Maybe you're realizing that there's some sin inside of you. Maybe you recognized it today for the first time and you're saying, God, I need help. Maybe you have recognized it and it's time for you to repent from it. And it's also time for you to recover from it by asking the Holy Spirit to move in and to push that sin out of your heart, that the love for God would be greater than your love for this sin. And it would start to push that greed or that sin out of your heart. Maybe what you need to do today up here on the screen is you need to surrender to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you've let some things come before Jesus and you are a Christian and you need your church to pray for you. We're going to pray for you in just a second. Maybe you are willing to say, I am going to step up and I'm going to protect the vulnerable in our community. I'm going to say a quick prayer for you. And this is going to wrap our service up. God, I lift up to you, the men and women that are watching this right now, 
Father, maybe you have already spoken to somebody's heart and maybe today you're drawing them to themselves and maybe, or to yourself, and maybe right now, right where they're sitting, watching this on their tablet or on their TV, they need to turn to you in faith. Father, would you help them to cry out a prayer of faith, asking you to change them and to, to forgive their sin? Would you cause them to just simply say, God, I'm a sinner. I can't get this sin out of my heart. I've tried as much as I can and it won't go away. So God, I need you to move in. I need you to clean me up. I need you to forgive my sin. I'm asking you to push this sin out of my heart and replace it with a love for you. Father, if that prayer is real, if it's sincere, I know you hear it. I know you honor it. I know you can transform somebody. God, for the people who are recognizing, even your people who are recognizing like Nehemiah did, that there's something wrong in my heart, would you cause them to be quick to repent and to go to you about it? Would you cause them to be willing to go to the brother or sister that they've done wrong and to make it right? Maybe they would reach out to this church and ask us to pray that they would have the strength and the courage to do that this week. God, would you help your people to do like Nehemiah does and to care for and to protect the weak and the vulnerable in our community. Father, would you be honored? Would you be glorified by the responses that your people are making as they put what they read from the Bible into action by taking a few action steps right now? God, I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have a great week. God bless you.